Funding for the production of Folks is made possible in part by a grant from Union National Life Insurance, serving Louisiana and the South since 1926, a family-managed corporation providing whole life insurance. Straight ahead on Folks, are black students underachieving in school because they believe that to excel academically means they're acting white? Today we travel to high schools in Shreveport and Baton Rouge, Louisiana to take a look at black students and academic achievement on today's edition of Folks. Hello everyone, I'm Sonia Massengale. Welcome to another edition of Folks. Recently, researchers trying to explain why many black students are still not on the same academic level as their white counterparts found out something perplexing. In their sampling of black students, they found that many students viewed academic achievement as white behavior. Well, that really set our thoughts in motion here, and we set out to find out whether that same thing would hold true among black students in Louisiana. We came up with some surprising answers to the question about academic achievement and racial identity and some other fascinating concerns that the students have about their schools and the public's perception of them. Later on, we'll have some education professionals joining us to help us examine the issues and concerns voiced by the students. But first, let's hear what these young black achievers had to say. Booker T. Washington High School in Shreveport is one of the oldest historically black high schools still in existence in Louisiana. These students are all high achievers. Have they ever been accused of acting white because they are good students? No, because just to see me on a hall or with my friends, you wouldn't think I was academically at that level because I try to separate my books from my, just say, fun time or whatever. Now, when I'm in the classroom, then I'll get serious and tone it down. And they say I look like a bookworm, but just to see with my friends, I start clowning or what have you. It's not acting white because it's, it's just like saying only white people are smart. That's not true because black people are intelligent also. Now, through my scholastic career, everyone, you know, seems to think, oh, she's trying to be better than us, but I'm trying to get myself through school because, you know, you see some people walking down the street. They have no education. You know, they just have no future. And I promised myself and my parents, you know, they would never see me in that situation. So I try to strive for the best that I can do because I couldn't stand to see myself, you know, in a bad position like that. Yeah, they call me nerd or whatever, you know, but uh, I don't let that bother me, you know. I just go in the classroom and do what I'm supposed to do. You know, I want to go to college and, you know, someday be whatever I want to be, you know. I can't, you know, if I let them, you know, discourage me, you know, then I'm not going to get anywhere. But uh, as long as I just uh, do what I'm supposed to do. And uh, I thank my parents a lot for that because they teach me and guide me in the right direction for as education is concerned. They teach me to do what I am told to do in the classroom uh, and so forth. They uh, encourage me to get the best education that I can, you know, because, you know, people going on the street, walking around, you know, they don't have any money because they don't have any education and so forth, you know, and I don't want to be like that. Booker T. Washington has been the subject of some heated debate in Caddo Parish. Some community members say the academic program has failed to keep up with those at integrated schools, but these high achievers believe that those allegations are unfair and that there are some distinct advantages to attending a predominantly black school. To me, it's an advantage because when I lived in Arkansas, I went to a mostly white school and I just kind of felt lost, you know, because I wasn't really getting the one-on-one -on -one attention that I get here at Booker T. And like when I first moved down here and I found out I was coming to Booker T, people asked me, what school are you going to? I said, I'm going to BT, you know, they say, that school? 
and I, I don't, I didn't, ever, I never did understand, you know, why everybody had all the negative thoughts about it until I heard all the rumors. And I try to tell people that they're not true. I enjoy Booker T. People don't believe me, you know. I just, I like my school, you know. I like school. Period. The teachers seem to take an interest, you know, in what you're doing. And with the white, you know, at a predominant, at a, excuse me, a partially white school. I, don't, I didn't seem to get that attention that I got here, and I like I like attention, so <laughs> I got it. I think that it's an advantage because, all right, we being an all-black school and the teachers being mostly black here, they're trying to help us more, you know, so we can be prepared for the outside world. They try to help us more by helping us get scholarships and preparing us for the ACT and everything so that we can be prepared for college just like everybody else. I was a student at Gosno Junior High School, and that was in Arkansas, and it was a mostly white school, and I felt pressure from some of the white students because they were envious of my good grades. I made better grades than most of them, and most of the teachers were white, so some of the, I know it was one time one of the students went to the teacher complaining, you know, I'm getting better grades than them, you know, so the teacher would just in some kind of way like embarrass me in front of the class or say I'm doing something wrong, insubordination as her favorite word was. And it just got to be a problem because they were jealous of me, the white students were. And then it turned out some of the black students were getting jealous too, so it was just kind of rough coming from both sides. How did you handle that? I just let it ride because I said I'm coming to school for me. Southern University Laboratory School is a part of Southern University School of Education. Although it is technically a public school, students must meet certain admissions criteria and pay a part of the yearly tuition fee. <laughs> Having a college prep curriculum, Southern Lab has the reputation of graduating high achievers. Once again, these students reported no problems with peer pressure relating to academic achievement, but they are sensitive to the public's impression of predominantly black schools as academically inferior. I've seen a Southern Lab all my life but I've never attended an integrated school. But I believe that a predominantly black school is just as good or better because being predominantly black, you try harder to achieve or accomplish your goals. I've attended an integrated school and the atmosphere is, is real different. Like at the school I attended, they, it's like a push between white and black, seeing who can make the best, who should be the president and all this. But since I've came to Southern Lab, the fact that people say we're inferior because we're predominantly black, that pushes us more to make better grades and go in the world. Even though I do attend a predominantly black school, let's say on the weekends when me and my friends go out, there's a popular club called 2010, and it's both black and white students, and we get along predominantly well. We have nothing against the other color people. So I, I don't have anything against them. No one takes offense against me. I think we get along fine. Southern Lab is by no means an inferior school because we have competed against other schools and come out in first place, you know, on top. And I feel that not only black schools, but all schools can be improved upon. But at Southern Lab, they, you know, they, the academic standard here is of excellence and the quality of learning is very good. The teachers take time out with you, make sure that you understand, make sure that you learn. Do you think it's an advantage or a disadvantage to attend a predominantly black high school and why? Uh, I feel there's also a cultural advantage uh, at the laboratory school. Here, um, this is one of the only schools in Paris who that celebrates black history and celebrates the uh, birthday Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, during Black History Month, we have uh, numerous of skits, plays, and different other activities in each class, and it's very interesting. It's like coming from home to a home mm -hmm. as education. It's like learning with your family. Mostly everyone's family here. It's distant cousins you find in Southern Lab. Mm -hmm. it's it's just the atmosphere is very nice. And you don't have any kind of tensions like I should be better than 
this Japanese kid next to me or this white kid on the other side of me, it's like I should better be better than him because he is doing well, so I should be doing well. Baton Rouge Magnet High School was one of the first schools in East Baton Rouge Parish to employ the magnet school concept. A student must have good grades to be enrolled here. We found that here, several students had had some problems from their peers, mostly in their neighborhoods, on the issue of academic achievement and racial identity. Well, I live in a predominantly black neighborhood, and I grew up with everybody in the neighborhood, and now they mostly go to Capitol and schools like that. And when I chose to come to Baton Rouge High, they thought, well, she's going to change, and she's going to be sedity and act more sophisticated than we are, so we just can't associate with her anymore. So I feel like they just don't really understand what the world is about or what they want to do. And since I do, I should be an outcast. But I don't feel um, like that. I feel like I'm headed for our future. And I want to go that way. I want to be who I want to be. And I'm not going to let what they say stop me. And as far as having a broader vocabulary or being more educated than they are, I feel like I am. Because I have taken advantage of the situation that they chose not to. I've been experiencing this for a long time, you know, since before I came to Baton Rouge High. And um, it's like people try to pull you back because you're trying to get ahead, which isn't really fair at all. Like now, you'll, be t you'll talk to someone, they'll say, where you go to school, Baton Rouge High, that's it. You know, they're like, oh, we know what you are, and that's, they don't want to have anything else to do with you. It's like we're being stereotyped in our own way because we're trying to get ahead. They never told me that personally because the people I grew up with, you know, I feel that they are the people that I would always have to come back to. You know, the people that started me off, you know, gave me their moral support, you know. I mean, you, you always know where you come from. You always know where you're going. And those same people you might need to go back to. Do you think it's an advantage or a disadvantage to attend an integrated school, and why? Um, I think it's an advantage because it, it puts you in situations where you must learn to get along with people from, with different social, economic, and cultural backgrounds. And that's basically how it's going to be in the real world after you get out of high school and college. And so I think it's preparing me anyway for the real world. I think attending an integrated school is just another part of your education because you know, you're learning about other people and because I came from a predominantly white school and it was a big adjustment for me to come here and you know because I had been like there since fourth grade then you learn I mean I'm lear I learned more about myself and about other blacks besides learning about other cultures once you've achieved your goals and you are that high achieving professional that you plan to be now how do you think that will affect the way you relate to the people in the black community I want to be able to go back and, and still have my old friends and still be able to talk about old times and make some new times with them, you know. Just show them, you know, that I still want to be their friend. Not, not you know, because I made it, I want to be like, oh, hi, how you doing? I can't talk to you because um, I'm in a higher tax bracket or, <laughs> <laughs> or it's like I, I live uptown and y'all still down here. I don't want it to be like that because it's not, because the person shouldn't be judged by their bank account, you know, or what, you know, what they've done. It's like the person inside, the person that's trying to, you know, when you're trying to be a certain person, when you're trying to let other people know who you are and what you want to be. I want, I want to be able to see that and not like what how, kind of house they live in and all that. Because like before I came to Louisiana, I, my family was living like in a one room project in Chicago. And I thank God that we come this far and that I'm able to come, you know, throw away 3,000 miles away, though still, I was fortunate enough to be able to come to Baton Rouge High and find out about the world and what the world is talking about. And you see it every day, not just the blacks, but the whites, the Spanish, you know, the Vietnamese, the Indians, all of, all of which go here, and the teachers too. I mean, you see a broad spectrum of cultures, and ideas, and it's good that a person can come in and kind of get a grasp of what everybody's talking about. Maybe they can make a better judgment about things later on in life. No one is guaranteed success. 
I mean, like, without God, nowhere. That's the way I see it. And that's the way a lot of people see it, like Carl. And um, I met people here in Baton Rouge High, like Carl, that have inspired me a lot. And um, like I was saying at first, the people that I came from, they gave me the moral support to uh, keep going. And, you know, without them, I'm nowhere. I don't think I would ever be able to forget where I came from. Like Donna said, I might go up and be making a good income or something, but you can't forget. And I think the people who do forget where they came from and how hard it was to get there really miss something in life. They don't, I don't know, they don't really think about it. It was a hard struggle because this is my first step. Being in Baron is my first step, I think, in achieving any of my goals. But I did come from a predominantly black school, and I know how the black people are, you know, because that's where I came from, and I'm not going to forget no matter how high I be. Because if you go up, you, you might have to come down. And if you forgot what it's like, you're not going to make it. So why forget? Be yourself. Joining me in the studio today is Dr. Press Robinson of the East Baton Rouge School Board and Mr. Cortez Frank. He's an educator and one of the teachers at Southern University Laboratory School, some of the students that we just saw before. Welcome to folks. Mr. Cortez, were you aware that some of your students might be experiencing uh, some difficulties with peer pressure because they were achieving in school? I was not aware that specific students were experiencing difficulties, but it's not unusual that many students who are academically excellent or high achievers would experience difficulty with their peers. Uh, I thought it was significant that the students that attended the integrated schools tended to experience that a little more profoundly. Do you have any ideas as to why that might be so? I think along with academic pressures, students at desegregated schools have other pressures to contend with. Uh, students at predominantly black schools do have academic pressures and they compete among each other. And it is just normal that students would envy one another, uh, rib each other, uh, call each other nerds or what have you, if one is more studious than the other. Some of these <coughs> behaviors are typical among teens or adolescents or youth in general. Others, and especially those students in desegregated environments, would have other factors to cope with in addition to that which is typical of teenage behavior. Well, I was pleased to see that in all three schools, and all three schools were very different, that the students had developed some really profound coping skills to deal with those kinds of pressures. Uh, as you can see from the feature presentation, uh, the students at the predominantly black schools tended to be very sensitive about the public image of their schools as predominantly black. Uh, they had been told through the media and otherwise that their schools were not acceptable. And this question goes to Mr. Robinson. How do you suppose that affects their, their expectations once they get out of school? Well, I'm not so sure it, expects their, uh, it affects their expectations once they're out of school as much as it does while they're there. Uh, I think that once they've gotten out, they probably have learned how to cope with the situation. But what, in fact, it does uh, is that it puts added pressure on those students because they're being told from uh, almost every angle that you can think of that their education is inferior, uh, and they have to work with that. Now, once they do get out of school, however, and get their little diploma in their hand, goes out for that job that they're looking for, the workplace feels also that they've gotten an inferior education, which again now is added pressure on this young person because now uh, he or she cannot get the job that they're entitled to because they, quote, went to a school that was preceded and notice I use the word precede because that's what it is, a perception. In many instances, it's not true, but the perception is there and we live perceptions. I'm very proud of the fact that I attended a predominantly black high school, Southern Lab, as a matter of fact, and also a predominantly black, historically black college. And uh, many, many of our leaders 
come from predominantly black schools, for example, in Shreveport, at Booker T. Washington, anyone who is anyone in politics, medicine, uh, teaching in that area now came from Booker T. Washington before schools were integrated. But the question comes up whether or not it is viable and or feasible to have predominantly one race schools in this day and time. Well, the answer to that, uh, Sonia Curry, is that there's certainly nothing wrong with all black schools. A student can certainly learn and learn very well. I'm a product of all black schools myself, uh, even up to my PhD. Uh, the thing that we have to look at today is that the world uh, community is ever expanding for us because of uh, telephone, television, uh, travel, and whatnot. And what we need to be doing is teaching our youngsters at as early an age as possible how to be a world uh, survivor not just in your own community anymore. And that's the advantage of being in an integrated society. Uh, we're going to have to work in it, live in it, and the future holds that it's going to be even more uh, integrated. This is a very cosmopolitan country we have here. And the sooner we learn how to cope with all these various cultures and pressures and whatnot, certainly the better it is. But it doesn't mean that an individual who gets a, quote, all-black education will not be able to cope, because if they are well-educated, they will be able to cope. Mr. Frank, did you also attend a predominantly black school coming up? No, I didn't. Okay, no, you, didn't. you're the product of integrated schools from grade school on up? From grade school on up, I uh, was the first black to graduate in top five, and there were only 10 blacks in my graduating class. Of course, I did grad graduate from Southern University with my undergraduate degree. Okay. Of course, one of the other things, Sonia, is that uh, this business of uh, integrated education is relatively new as history goes. So those of us who are in maybe leadership roles at this time almost had to come from black schools. Okay. Continuing with Mr. Frank, how do you compare the high school situations with, say, your integrated school when you went to school to where you're teaching now, which is really predominantly black? Do you think that those students are receiving the same things that you got? I do. I feel that they are getting what I got and more. Uh, I agree, however, with Dr. Robinson. They do need coping skills. There is a diverse cultural community out there, and they will have to survive it. However, there are those opportunities that are more prevalent for them and available to them at Southern Labs that they will be alienated from in other situations. Secondly, when I came through uh, in the early 70s, we really had to compete and <clears throat> We fulfill quota systems. Once you had one black in the beta club or one black and female uh, in other clubs, that was it. I think in Southern Lab, however, a student can't help but be judged by the content of his or her character rather than the color of his or her skin. And more of them can be engaged in many curricular activities. I also feel that, um, unfortunately, too many of our black athletes are being exploited in the um, desegregated situations. Our students deserve more than just athletic development. They will, I think they deserve academic maturation also. And more of that is provided at Southern Labs with these youngsters. There's life after sports. There is yeah. life after sports. That's yeah. something important we <clears throat> can pass on to our young people. I would have to disagree with you, though. I felt that on one of your points, I believe that you said, uh, that they would have to be socialized on all, on all levels, and they are being socialized on all levels. I think we heard uh, Mr. Robinson's son say that he, was, uh, he goes to the, the teenage club on weekends, and they interact with whites, and they feel comfortable. The other students say they go to rallies, and they interact with whites, and they feel comfortable there. They feel as fully equipped to deal with the white world, so to speak, as students in integrated situations. There <coughs> is a part, there are factors in the process of education. That, has, that have to go on out inside that classroom. Mm -hmm. And it involves interaction with your peers. You need to interact with other race students. You need to live some of their experiences vicariously. Uh, all of it cannot be taught in the textbook. I can learn a lot about Indian culture, talking to a student whose native is India, or uh, I can talk with Mexican or Spanish-speaking persons and learn so much more than I can out of a textbook. A lot of uh, peer interaction and social socialization that goes on on that campus 
is a part of the process of education that you don't get out in the nightclub or uh, in the movies. And I don't think that social interaction was the part of the uh, academic process he was talking about. <laughs> and of course, you don't want to get the impression that that is the only arena in which this happens. That's important, too. And, and Cortez is quite, quite correct. Uh, it need, there's a broad spectrum that you need to cover. I see. There's so much going on in Louisiana right now uh, in regards to the desegregation of our schools on all levels, from college level on down. And uh, the quality of the educational system is under fire right now. But I, do you, can we feel reasonably comfortable that our children are getting a good education, whatever school they're in, especially those that are in predominantly black neighborhoods and go to predominantly black schools? Sure you can, Sonia. But, but what kind of an education a child gets depends on him or herself, really. I mean, it's an individual thing. Uh, the, the teachers are there. Uh, the school facilities are there, the, the, the resources are there, but the student is the one that has to get it. Now, there's an old saying that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. This is exact analogy. I mean, you can give it to the student, but you can't make them get it. What we need to start doing in Louisiana and the other parts of the United States of America is stop talking about what's bad about our schools and our educational system and talk about the good things that happen. Do you realize if we have a fight or something bad to happen on a school campus, we get all kinds of media attention, but let us win a great prize uh, in mathematics or some, some other academic field. You can't get anybody to cover it. Nobody wants to talk about it. It's not newsy. No That's where our problems lie. Of course, we need more money in education. I'll be the first to say that, but those are some problems as well. Well, Mr. Cortez, we'll be looking for you to help us bring out some of those good things that are going on in education in the years to come. Exactly. Mr. Robinson, you're on the front line and dealing with the public and getting the monies together, and we appreciate your being there, and thank you for being on phones. Thank, thank, thank you. Me. It's been enjoyable. We're out of time for today. Next week, our program's about color bias within the black community. Be sure to tune in. Bye-bye. <laughs>